The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, Vincent van Gogh's sunflowers in Tokyo are the subject of a legal claim in the US relating to Nazi loot. Plus, is Singapore on the rise as an art hub? And the artist Grace Lau on her photographic project for Chinese New Year. The art newspaper's London correspondent and resident Van Gogh expert Martin Bailey tells me why the Sunflowers painting in Tokyo is at the centre of a legal dispute 35 years after it was sold for a record price at auction and why the heirs of the German-Jewish banker Paul von Mendelssohn Bartholdy, who owned it until the 1930s, now value it at a staggering $250 million. One of our editors at large, Georgina Adam, has just returned from Singapore, where the first Art SG art fair took place last week. So how successful was this new event in the art market calendar and what does it tell us about Singapore's ambitions to become an art hub? And this episode's Work of the Week is Portraits in a Chinese Studio, a photographic work by the artist Grace Lau. In the project, which marks Chinese New Year, Lau is subverting the tradition of colonial 19th century portrait studios in a shopping centre in Southampton on the south coast of the UK. Before all that, why not take advantage of our latest subscription offer? You can save up to 40% on a digital subscription in our January sale. Go to theartnewspaper.com, click subscribe and enter the code JWEB23. That's J-W-E-B-23. Do also subscribe to this podcast and our sister podcast, A Brush With, wherever you're listening and leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Now, at the end of last year, the heirs of a German-Jewish banker, Paul von Mendelssohn Bartholdy, issued a legal claim to a painting of sunflowers by Vincent van Gogh that's in the collection of a Japanese insurance company. Mendelssohn Bartholdy had owned the painting until the 1930s, half a century before it was sold to the Japanese company at auction. The complaint was filed in the US District Court of the Northern District of Illinois by three plaintiffs on behalf of more than 30 Mendelssohn Bartholdy beneficiaries. I spoke to Martin Bailey, our London correspondent and author of our weekly Adventures with Van Gogh blog and several books on the artist, to find out more. Martin, we're talking about Van Gogh's sunflowers, but which one? (laughs) <laughs> well, he did three versions of the sunflowers, the famous sunflowers, against a yellow background. The first one he did, the original, uh, is now in the National Gallery in London, and that's the finest version. And he also made two copies a few months later. Uh, we don't know why he made two. He made one of them for Goga and uh, one for some other reason. And it's one of the copies uh, that uh, is at the centre of this huge legal dispute. Okay. So tell us first off, when Van Gogh painted it, you know, he barely sold a work in his lifetime. So what happened to it after he died and so on? The version of the sunflowers was inherited by Vincent's brother, Theo, who died six months later. And it was then sold by the widow of Theo in 1894, which was quite early. And it was bought by another artist, Emil Schufnecker, Um, who held it for a while. And the key date is about 1910, when the painting was bought by Paul Mendelssohn Bartholdy, who is at the centre of this uh, legal wrangle, and he bought it in 1910. Okay, before we go into the details of it, I just want to establish where it is now and why. So it's in Japan now. Yes, in 1987, it was bought by what was then known as the Yasuda Museum, which was set up by a Japanese insurance company called Yasuda. Some years later, there was a change in the company's structure and the company was renamed Sompo. And it's in their own museum. Uh, Initially, their museum was actually on the 42nd floor of their skyscraper office in Tokyo. And it, it was the most bizarre experience to go up there and to see Van Gogh's sunflowers way above on the skyline of Tokyo. (laughs) Anyway, they've now built a a new museum on the ground level uh, next to their skyscraper, and the sunflowers is on view there. Is it it, it kind of the jewel of the crown of the collection, would you say? It is. It's the icon, and it's sort of the centrepiece of the museum. Right. Now, it's sold 
at Christie's in 1987. Was it a record price at that time? It was very much a record. It was £25 million, which was three times more than any other painting had sold for an Italian Renaissance painting. And it's difficult to believe now, but it was the first painting of the 19th or 20th century which sold for a record sum at auction. And of course, nowadays, it's exactly the reverse. You know, it's only very occasionally that old masters uh, get up there at the top. Yeah, it was really striking to see that the previous record was held by Mantegna or <laughs> yeah. something. You know, really, it really yeah, makes you realise how far we've come. Yeah. At that time in the 1980s, there was a real boom in Van Gogh at auction, right? Uh, well, this was really the start of the boom. It was interesting that it went to Japan, and Japan at that point was beginning to buy uh, major Impressionist works. Japanese companies and uh, tycoons wanted to buy Western art, and Impressionism was at the top of their list, and on their list, Van Gogh and Monet came on top. Now, this dispute is over a claim by the family of the owner that you mentioned earlier on, yeah. the Mendelssohn-Bartoli family. Yeah. Can you give a flavour of where we were in 1987 when that painting was sold at yeah. auction in terms of Nazi loot and spoliation and repatriation and so on? It was a very different world, and you're quite right. We need to think back what, what it was like then. Um, the question of spoliation was beginning to be considered, but was not considered a, a high priority. And it was really in the 1990s, and particularly towards the end of the 1990s, that it became a key issue and museums began to examine their holdings. And if there were questions over the Nazi period, which was 1933 to 45, then there would be further investigations. So it is understandable that when Christie sold the painting in 1987, it wasn't really on people's minds, this question of spoliation. Right. So let's go into the provenance then. When was a the painting sold to the Mendelssohn-Bartoli family? Well, first of all, I should say that when Christie sold it in 1987, it was not clear when the Mendelssohn-Bartoli family had actually sold it. What we knew was that they bought it in 1910. So it was thought, well, it might have been sold in the 20s or the 30s. What is new and what is clear in the legal case is that the painting was actually sold in 1934. Now, that date is very important because it's the year after the Nazis seized power in Germany. So we're talking about the Nazi period. So effectively, the, the argument is that it was a forced sale, that as in the case of so many other works yeah. at that time, they were sold because of the political conditions in Germany, yeah. which forced many Jewish people to sell their works, of course, which were regarded as degenerate at that time. And so yes. On. The claimants are arguing that it was a forced sale. Uh, now, what does that mean, really? Jews were being persecuted. So the claimants are arguing that Mendelssohn Bartoli, as a Jew, and also as a banker, was being persecuted. On the other hand, we don't know the price that was actually paid for the painting. Uh, that has not been discovered. So the claimants are arguing that in this period, in post-33, the prices of all such artworks were falling and therefore logically he didn't get what he would have got for the sunflowers if he'd sold it a few years earlier. Is it right that we can't work out what it would have sold for as you say but there are hints that you can gather based upon the amount it was insured for after the sale? Uh, yes we know that it was insured by a British owner who bought it the Beatty family it was insured for just over £10,000. Now that's quite a, a reasonable price for a Van Gogh painting in the 1930s. And of course, Sunflowers was a very important painting, so you would expect it to have a high insurance value. But all it proves is what the British buyer paid for the painting to the dealer in Paris. It doesn't explain what the German collector who sold the painting received. So it doesn't actually answer the question, was it a forced sale or not? Right. And so was it auctioned on behalf of the Beatty family by Christie's? Is that right? Yes, it was Helen Beatty, who was the daughter-in-law of the Beatties who bought the painting, who sold it at Christie's in 1987. OK, so let's now turn to the lawsuit. What is the claim in the lawsuit? Well, there are staggering amounts involved. Uh, first of all, the painting is requested, the return of the painting, and uh, the claimants value it at $250 million. 
Now, that might seem a lot, but I think it's not unreasonable. It's, after all, an iconic image. Whenever we think of Van Gogh, we think of the sunflowers and maybe Starry Night as well. And Van Gogh Landscape uh, sold for $107 million last year. So that valuation is a ballpark figure, but it's, it's not unreasonable. But in addition, the claimants are asking for damages of $750 million. And they argue that the Japanese insurance company has benefited from holding the painting, that it's increased the prestige of the company, and that they're associated with uh, fine art and Van Gogh and everything. And that's been of enormous value to the insurance company. Right. So effectively, those are punitive damages, as they're called. Indeed. I mean, it seems a huge sum, but um, we're not in a position to evaluate that. That'll be for the courts. Absolutely. Now, as we said, some Sumpo has not yet issued a statement. Are they planning to? Are we expecting anything to come out from the Japanese insurance uh, Not immediately. And the documents are currently being translated into Japanese to be formally served on the company. So they have not yet uh, received them. And in the meantime, they're not commenting. In a way, that's uh, no surprise. Um, mm. But no doubt at some point they will. Now, there's this really intriguing element of your blog, Martin, in which there's a letter from the Sompo Museum to the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam when the painting was lent to them in the early 2000s, in which they bring up the very subject of the provenance and its relation to the spoliation issue. Well, that was very interesting. And it's most unusual to see that sort of communication between two leading museums when they were never expecting that that would be made public. Mm. What they said effectively, what the Sompo Museum said, was they didn't think there was a problem with the Nazi era spoliation, but they weren't 100% sure. Now, that's, on the face of it, not unreasonable. And one could compare it to the lists of possibly spoliated works, which museums all around the world have published at that time for the 1933-45 period, just to say the provenance is unclear. On the other hand, you could argue that if they'd had those thoughts, they ought to have put more efforts into investigating the provenance. Right. Now, we don't know whether they did or they didn't, but it was surely a warning that it needed to be examined more clearly. But it's interesting, isn't it, though, that the Van Gogh Museum replied that they felt that the provenance was clear. Yes, that's interesting. And uh, no doubt that reassured the Sompo Museum, uh, the fact that Van Gogh Museum had said that the provenance seemed to be clear. On the other hand, we don't know exactly what the Van Gogh Museum said, and they didn't have the legal responsibility to justify the purchase and the holding of the painting, which the Japanese museum had. Now, what's your sense of what's going to happen here? Because these things can be quite protracted and, and last for years, can't they? I think the only thing one can say with certainty is that the lawyers will do very, very well out of it. <laughs> um, there are huge uh, sums of money involved. I think it's going to be very protracted and take a long time. And in the meantime, uh, the painting will presumably continue on display in the Tokyo Museum. It obviously won't travel. There would be too many legal risks. So from that point of view, it would be good when the issue is finally resolved. Martin, as ever, thank you very much. Thank you. You can read Martin's blog, Adventures with Van Gogh, at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS and Android. And Martin's book, The Sunflowers Are Mine, The Story of Van Gogh's Masterpiece, is published by Francis Lincoln and priced $25 or £18.99. Coming up, we explore Singapore's Art SG Fair and Grace Lau's project for Chinese New Year. But first, here's this week's news bulletin. A memorial honouring Martin Luther King Jr. and his wife Coretta Scott King was unveiled last week at the Boston Common in Massachusetts. The embrace is a monumental bronze conceived by the US artist Hank Willis Thomas and the design studio Mass Design Group and reportedly cost $10 million. It's based on a photograph showing the Kings hugging and features only the couple's arms. The response has been mixed even among members of the King family. 
Andrea Waters King, the wife of Martin Luther King III, described the clasping hands as a remarkable statement of mutual love and solidarity. But Seneca Scott, a cousin of Coretta Scott King, wrote that it looks more like a pair of hands hugging a beefy penis than a special moment shared by the iconic couple. A new report published by the UK's House of Lords this week has slammed the Conservative government's approach to the arts, describing it as complacent and at risk of jeopardising the sector's commercial potential. The Communications Committee report notes that the creative industries scarcely featured in the 2022 autumn statement and were not included in the government's five priorities for growth. This lack of focus risks affecting the UK's future prosperity, especially at a time of rising international competition in the sector and domestic economic challenges the report says. The Tories' cultural policies, it adds, are characterised by incoherence and barriers to success. And finally, the artist Peter Doig has been awarded $2.5 million in a long-running legal saga. The episode began in 2013 when the Chicago gallerist Peter Bartlow and a former prison corrections officer named Robert Fletcher sued Doig. They claimed that the painting in Fletcher's possession was an early work made by the artist in prison in 1976, but that Doig was denying authorship of it, making it valueless on the art market. Doig has never been to prison and it seems likely that it was the work of Pete Doig or Doige, a late former inmate of the prison whose surname is spelt differently from the famous artist as it is in the signature on the painting. A judge ruled in support of $2.5 million in sanctions and stated that the plaintiff's claims were factually meritless. Peter Doig will donate the money to a non-profit that gives incarcerated people opportunities to make art. You can read all these stories and much more on the website or the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Take a closer look with Christie's at Classic Week in New York. This January, the wide-ranging sales series comprises 10 auctions celebrating art and objects from antiquity to the 20th century. Discover everything from a bronze lion-headed goddess and the first printing of the final Emancipation Proclamation to captivating portraits by Francisco de Goya. Many of the leading lots hail from two groundbreaking collections focusing on a storage genre of art history. Remastered old masters from the collection of J.E. Safra and modern Medici, masterpieces from a New York collection. Preview the works at Christie's Rockefeller Centre Galleries from the 21st to the 26th of January and in the meantime, browse the sales online at christies.com slash classicweek. Welcome back. Now, following delays caused by the COVID pandemic, Singapore's new fair, Art SG, took place last week. It's the latest in a host of major events in Asian centres as the art market there continues to expand and explore markets beyond its established centres. Georgina Adam, an editor-at-large at the art newspaper, went to Singapore for this first edition and I spoke to her about the experience and what it tells us about Singapore's position in the Asian art ecosystem. Georgina, you're just back from Singapore. First of all, tell us what the fair was like. So this was the first iteration of a new fair, which is called Art SG. It had to be put off for two years because of COVID. And it's organised by the sort of triumvirate of Tim Etchell, Sandy Angus and Magnus Renfrew. And MCH, which is the parent company of Art Basel, has got a 15% stake in it. So it's held in the convention centre, which is right beside this behemoth Marina Bay Sands hotel. Lots of people have seen pictures of it. It's three pillars. And on top of them, there's something that looks like a skateboard, which is actually an enormous swimming pool. And uh, it sits on top of sort of vast casino and shopping and, you know, shop until you drop um, with all the big brand names. There was an art fair there before called Art Stage Singapore, but it had actually died in uh, 2019. So this was a much more professional fair, much more international, and pretty well all the heavy hitters were there, you know, Zwerner, Pace, Gagosian. It was spread over two floors, and they put all the big ones at the bottom, and then the slightly smaller ones at the top. It looked good, well organised. I think the organisers had done their very best. From what I gathered walking around a number of times and talking to people is that uh, sales were slow. Right. And tell me about the kind of calibre of the works that are on view and all that kind of thing. You know, you can always tell the priority that fairs have in dealers' global sort of outlook by the kind of effort they put into their fairs. Was this 
a series of booths of all the gallery's roster, you know, one work by each, modest price levels comparatively, all that kind of stuff. Were they pulling all the stops out and having solo booths and more sort of kind of imaginative approach to the whole thing? There was definitely a tentativeness about it. There were some solo booths, obviously, but not that many. Uh, What was interesting was that very expensive works were not brought. In fact, price points were, were actually quite modest in some cases, particularly on the upper floor. It seems that people brought a bit of everything, mainly painting. There was a strong, strong current of of painting of things that are quite easy to buy and hang on a wall. I hardly saw any video, if any at all. And do you think that's about collectors as opposed to trends? Do you know what I mean? Because obviously wet painting has been something we talked about a lot on Mm, here. mm. But do you think it's more about a kind of conservatism in terms of what the collectors might buy? I think exactly that. I think it was that they thought that was the thing that was most likely to sell. And I think there was a real strong feeling that they were testing the water. I really felt that. Not too expensive, certainly not challenging, and slightly hope for the best. One dealer said something to me which I thought was very interesting from one of the big galleries, and he said, so I think galleries are ready for Singapore. I'm not quite sure that Singapore is ready for the galleries yet. What do you think they meant by that? I think what they meant was that Singapore is incredibly focused on creating itself as a hub, a cultural hub uh, for Southeast Asia, particularly for Southeast Asia. They're looking rather more west, I would have said, than east in a way. They're looking to places like Malaysia and Indonesia, which are obviously very close. I went out there with the feeling that this was going to take over from Hong Kong. I don't think that's the case. Talking to a lot of different people, I really feel that Singapore is putting its best foot forward. And there's a lot of cultural activity. But it is not ready to replace Hong Kong as the art market hub in Asia. One thing I'm really interested in is that there's a lot of talk about the idea of a dominant hub in Asia. And you mentioned Hong Kong there, and Hong Kong has had that role, if you like, up until now. But of course, we've talked about Seoul on this podcast. Now we're talking about Singapore. It seems to me that it's sort of absurd to talk about a dominant hub in such a vast region. Can all three of these places coexist as hubs, as in Hong Kong, Seoul and Singapore now? I suppose that's possible, yes. And I've certainly heard, yes, not just a single hub. But nevertheless, Hong Kong retains one thing which is amazing, which is that it is a vast free port in the sense that there's no tax. On the 1st of January of this year, just before the fair opened, the Singaporean authorities put up their goods and services tax. They put it up from 7 to 8%. I have it on a number of people close to Singapore that it's going to go up to 9 and that the objective is to put it up to 10%. And so I think that Hong Kong, without any tax at all, ease of doing business there, even with the mainland authorities tightening up, I think Hong Kong still retains a lot of attraction, particularly for the art trade. It's interesting that, isn't it? Because however much we might talk about human rights and ethics and all that kind of thing, the art market is ultimately going to be focused on things like tax. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Now, of course, there is a huge free port at uh, Singapore, but Hong Kong is just one huge free port. Right. Tell me about the rest of the kind of cultural offering, if you like, in Singapore, because you mentioned that they're really intent on turning it into a hub. What kind of things are they doing? So they've got um, a new five-year plan, which runs from this year, 2023 to 2027, which has been initiated by the National Arts Council. And they really do want to create everything. They want to create an art ecosystem. Uh, They're putting money, obviously, into museums, into all sorts of different cultural events, And they also are interested in the market. They want to bulk up the art market. One of the things that they're doing is they've got this new district, which is huge, absolutely vast. I went there. It's called Tanjong Pagar. And that's where part of the Singapore Biennale is being held. It's been held in other places. And they are apparently going to build some sort of a museum there as well. There's enormous galleries. And I went to a number of galleries there. Of course, they already have Gilman Barracks, which is um, an old colonial barracks, but they don't seem to be able to make it work. It's 
sort of half occupied. I suppose there were about 12 galleries there and there were some good things on show, but it just feels a bit empty, slightly desolate. You just don't get the feeling of a buzz. One of the things about these kind of cultural hubs is that it requires a certain level of permanent engagement. Of course, by creating this moment, vast numbers of people from the art world will attend the fair and will go to Singapore at that one moment. Do you have any confidence that people will for the rest of the year? Because I guess things like the Gilman Barracks will depend upon a constant flow, wouldn't they? Well, they've been trying to make Gilman Barracks work for years and years. And in fact, they've had other cultural projects as well. I think one of the big problems is that they don't have very many big galleries there. Now, Leem and Mopin have just appointed somebody as a sort of local representative, but they haven't opened an actual space there. But I think that is quite a positive thing. There was a very small fair called SEA Focus, but Alan Lowe, who's a Hong Kong-based, very rich young man and also a collector, he's endowed it with an art prize for the next three years. So there are things happening. And interestingly, Alan Lowe's one wife is actually from Singapore and they spend some of their time in Singapore now. But he was very careful to emphasize that he's not giving up on Hong Kong and that he remains in Hong Kong, where of course he has business interests for the major part of the year. I want to talk about MCH. You mentioned them a bit earlier. In last week's episode, I had a conversation with Annie Shaw about Masterpiece, about the fact that that had been cancelled. Can we learn anything about its priorities based upon the fact that Masterpiece has been cancelled? They're involved in RTSG. They seem to be involved for the long haul. Can we detect any kind of shift in priorities at all? Well, it's very difficult to know But there was a rumour that I heard from more than one person that MCH, while they have cancelled Masterpiece and do not intend to open it up again in this country, in Britain, there is a case that they might think of taking it to Asia and possibly to Hong Kong. Of course, there was a part of it that was with Fine Art Asia during Art Basel, and I don't believe that was hugely successful. But there could be an argument made because... Masterpiece is also about luxury goods, pens, watches, and so on, jewellery. That, of course, is an offering that Asia is very, very interested in. They're very interested in luxury goods. So I think that there might be a case. I don't know what MCH, whether they want to resell it. I believe they bought it for between 7 and $8 million. How much it's worth now since it's been effectively killed, I don't know. Or maybe they might even give it away. I just don't know. But I think that that was an interesting theory. Indeed. So you mentioned five-year plans and so on. Mm. Singapore is something which is going to be on our radars for some time. You think there's a sort of level of investment in it in terms of time and energy that will propel it for a little while longer at least? All of the dealers I spoke to realised that even though sales were reportedly pretty slow this time, that they were going to have to come back. They had to build up relationships and watch what happens. Plus, of course, the the government investment, although the government is perhaps, I mean, it certainly hasn't done any favours by increasing this tax because that is not improving on their competitivity. But I think that the fact that there is so much money being put into culture, that there is this cultural push, the fact that the fair will come back, even if sales were a bit sluggish this year. So I think that the dealers will come back because they do want to build relationships, notably with Southeast Asian collectors. Vietnam and Thailand were mentioned to me a number of times, and that was quite interesting to me. There are collectors and there's a lot of money in Vietnam, for example. And Singapore is more oriented towards those markets. So I think that is why dealers would come back. They'll come back to try to build relationships with these collectors. Georgina, as ever, thank you very much. Thank you. You can read Georgina's fair report on the website or the app.
Now, it's time for our first work of the week in 2023. From tomorrow to mark Chinese New Year on Sunday, the 22nd of January, the London-based artist Grace Lau will create a portrait studio in a shopping centre in Southampton in southern England. Portraits in a Chinese studio, as it's called, is presented by John Hansard Gallery in the Marland Shopping Centre. There, people in Southampton have an open invitation to sit for free portraits in a setting that subverts the portrait studio staged by Western photographers in 19th century China, stereotyping their subjects. I spoke to Lau about the project. Grace, you first made the work Portraits in a Chinese Studio back in 2005. Can you tell us about what led you to create that work and what the historical background to it was? Yes, certainly. I was doing some research work in the archives in London um, for a book that was going to be written by a friend of mine who's a Chinese historian on the connection between East and Western cultures. And photography came up in terms of Victorian explorers going to China and photographing the exotic peoples of the East. And so she wanted if I could uh, contribute to her book and do some research on photographs, which I did. And I found most of the pictures implied that the Chinese were rather backward and they were very exotic. And the particular uh, social types that were picked were people like beggars, opium smokers and um, courtesans and blind children. So these were made into pictures and postcards which were sent back to England and the missionaries as well wanted to raise some money back home in order to fund their course to convert the heathens in Asia. Right. Um, So all this added up to a whole archive all around the Western world of how the exotic Eastern people look like and their culture and so I decided it may be a very good idea to reverse the situation. And you reversed it in all sorts of ways, haven't you? First off, there's a lot of humour within the kind of environment you are placing your subjects in for a start. Yes, I always like to include humour in my work as well as the subversion element. Humour makes people laugh and it makes people look. And it makes people also curious. So the humour bit is kind of implied by the panda rug, I suppose that's what you mean. Yes, exactly. Yes, the panda rug actually indicates a little bit more than just the humour. It's a nod towards the Victorian tradition of shooting bears and tigers and those exotic animals and skinning them and putting them out as rugs in their dining room. Mm -hmm. So, you know, of course it's not done now, but that's what the panda skin was for. It's obviously a nylon mock panda rug which I bought in a junk shop in Hastings for five pounds. <laughs> <laughs> right and, and, and is it right that essentially you assembled that environment entirely from what you found in Hastings at that time? Yes absolutely. I applied to the Arts Council for funding and they thought it was a very good project to fund in terms of their cultural diversity scope so I went and bought all these for as cheap as I could, as cheap as possible, in the junk shops in Hastings, the two chairs, the rug, and all the other bits and pieces. And then I asked my friend, Robina, who is a theatre designer, to do the backdrop. And the backdrop makes reference to the Brighton Pavilion. And at the same time, it's a bit like some of the studio portraits taken by Victorians in China, where they laid out all those exotic props. Absolutely. And of course, another subversion is that you have, instead of picking the types, as the Victorians did, you are welcoming all comers, in a sense, you are not making an image of typical Western people in a Chinese studio, you're making an image of the full diversity, if you like, of people. Yes, that's absolutely right. That's why I called the whole project, actually, the 21st century types, their types. But at the same time, the people in Hastings are quite exotic. You know, there's a lot of fishermen, there are a lot of artists, there's a lot of very eccentric bohemians and bikers and people. So you can see the range of people in my photographs, but also the actual exhibition when it came out was picked by the curator who selected the most exotic ones. So there were 27 exotic pictures taken from 400 subjects. I did 400 portraits in all. 
Extraordinary. And each of them, is it right, was given a digital print at the time? Yes, each of them were given a digital print, which was done by a, my assistant. And I made all the film portraits from my Hasselblad camera. Right. Tell me about the Hasselblad camera. That seems to me to be a very deliberate decision to engage with a kind of history of photography. Oh, yes. Um, for a start, it's a very old Hasselblad camera. It was 50 years old. And I put it on um, a tripod so it looks a bit older, you know, how they used to do. And also it makes a clunky noise when you actually take the photograph, the, the shutter. It's a lovely clunky noise. And also you have to wind the film on and all that. So I deliberately played the kind of... Um, Victorian photographer, I asked my subjects to sit very still and look formally into the camera and not to move and not to blink. And they enjoyed that because it's a performance for them, you know, or portrait photography. It's a performance. Absolutely. And now you're reconstructing this in Southampton. Is there any change to what you're doing? Are you following exactly the same principles? Um, The only change is the season. It's winter now. It's Chinese New Year. In Hastings, it was in the summer season. So I got subjects who were dressed in bikinis and having ice creams and so on. But here now, everybody will be wrapped up with gloves and hats on and boots and everything and their shopping bags. So that's the only difference, the season. Can you say something about what the technical process is in terms of people arriving? Is it simply people can turn up and they will be included? There's no sifting, if you like, of your potential subjects. Yeah, no sifting at all. I want everybody to come. I've got a big team in in Southampton now, so I'll be able to actually manage if a crowd comes in and they have to queue up. Uh, At the same time, there's a booking system we've got as well, so people can book in advance. But People who book in advance will tend to dress up and they tend to want to pose, you know. And I prefer to just grab people off the streets so that you get the natural subjects. And tell me about how it manifests beyond this stage, because you say there is, in in essence, a kind of performance element. But do you intend again to produce exhibitions and potentially a book in relation to this stage of the project too? We'll see what happens, but I think, I hope that um, the John Hansard Gallery will probably like to keep an archive of this event and it may turn out to be another book, volume two, and then maybe if I take my studio along the road to uh, Blackpool or to Folkestone or to somewhere else, you know, we'll have volume three and four. Absolutely. I mean, Hastings and Southampton are very particular spaces within the British Isles. Yes. They are both on the water. They are both by the sea. Yes. Is it something about seaside resorts that attracts you in the sense that obviously if a town has a port, it can be a centre for the movement of peoples and things like that? Yes, yes, definitely. Because um, a port was where the first British photographers went to in China. Uh, like John Thompson, he set up his studio in Hong Kong and then Shanghai and then along the ports. And so did all the other Western photographers, because that's where you do get the movement of people. And also, I suppose you get people who are more willing to sit in front of the camera. And also there's a tradition of seaside photography anyway in England. And so a lot of people will think that this is a seaside event. Right. Like Punch and Judy shows and so (laughs) on. And so that's why they'll come in and sit for me. Most of them tend not to ask what the historical implications are. They just like to have a free photograph, which is fine. And to what extent do you find out about them? I know that you have sort of specific instructions, as you say, about how you ask them to sit and so on. Mm -hmm. Do you glean any personal information from them or do you like to have a kind of certain distance from them? Well, first of all, there's sometimes too many people coming in for me to have a conversation with them. But I do like to talk to them. If they want to ask me about the project, I'm very happy to talk to them about it. And in Hastings, I did have a few books written about the East and West cultures in in terms of visual imagery, but they tend not to be so interested, frankly. They just want to perform. And so I just kind of direct them, you know, the director um, and (laughs) performer. (laughs) Absolutely. Lastly, I wanted to ask, because I know that August Sander is another and much more, if you like, august influence on this whole process. Because, of course, he made the great People of the 20th Century project. Yes. To what extent... Was that a deliberate engagement from the first kernel of an idea? Or to what extent did you realise that it related to Sanders' project as you were in the process of making, if you like? 
I realised it related to August Sander because there was an exhibition of his imagery in, could have been the Hayward Gallery in London, a short time after I made the project 2005. I realised that um, a lot of my images related to his in terms of the variety of different people, the traders, the ordinary people, the farmers and so on. And so, yes, I, I became fascinated by his work. Well, Grace, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you, Ben. Grace Lau's Portraits in a Chinese Studio is at the Marlins Shopping Centre in Southampton, UK, from the 21st of January to the 12th of February. And that's it for this episode. You can find us on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Amy Dawson and David Clack. And David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Martin, Georgina and Grace. Thanks to you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.